So hopefully you remember I'm one of the, um, I guess, the, the PIs, instructors, or whatever for this course. I'm going to be teaching you today, uh, giving you an overview of the human genome. Anthony's been teaching a whole bunch of sort of computational skills, which are obviously important if you want to start doing sort of genome scale analysis. From my point of view, somebody who grew up in the lab, I now run a sort of combined wet lab, bioinformatics lab. I think it's equally, if not more important, to understand the biology of the systems you're looking at, because I know lots of really smart people who are great statisticians and programmers that start doing really stupid things because they don't understand the biology, the way the genome is, things like that. My aim over the next couple of hours is to try and give you guys um, a taste of some of the different facets of the genome, different features of it, so you can have a better understanding of these things and not end up making silly mistakes and wasting weeks of your time. And I'll split this into two or three parts so you guys have uh, breaks here and there and we'll try and finish hopefully by around 4.30 or so, so you have a, at least an hour to, to get some food and stuff and relax. Okay, if we were to go way back, um, these days we have genome sequencing. You can pump out somebody's genome in a matter of days. But historically, the original way that you would study somebody's genome was kind of like this. So this is a what we call a, a, a G-banded carrier type. So G-bands are these dark bands on the chromosomes produced by staining um, a uh, mitotic spread like this with uh, um, certain dyes and enzymes. And I say this was sort of the original way that you would screen somebody's DNA to look for, in this case, large DNA rearrangements, either you know, chromosome aneuploidies, translocations, or large deletions or duplications. N this is still used today. I wouldn't say it's the best technology by any means, but these things are still being done every day in cytogenetic labs. And hopefully you guys will know, we're starting at the base level here, I'll skip through this quite fast. In humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, that's 22 pairs of autosomes, numbered one through 22. And in addition to that, there are two sex chromosomes. So you can immediately tell we're looking at a male here, a single X and a Y. And the autosomes are numbered, what was originally thought, based on size. So chromosome one is the largest. Back in 1957, when this was first done, people thought chromosome 22 is the smallest. We actually know now, in fact, chromosome 21 is a little bit smaller than chromosome 22. But they did the best they could at the time and nobody's going to change it now that that system's been in place for more than 60 years. And G-banding works on the fact that every chromosome has a very characteristic banding pattern. So you can see, you know, these two pairs of chromosome ones have the same bands on them that are different, for example, to chromosome two. Um, in addition, the centromeres on different chromosomes are placed um, sometimes in the middle, sometimes at, at one end, or, or sometimes offset from the middle. And so if you're an experienced cytogeneticist, usually with, takes about four to six months of training, you can take something like this and within about 10 minutes produce this and figure out if somebody's missing pieces of chromosome, things like that. But it obviously has limited resolution. You generally can't see anything smaller than about 10 megabases in size. So you know, you're limited to spotting really big changes. Now, now that we're in the genomic era, we're more interested in the sequence of the DNA. So chromosomes that I've just shown you are made up of very tightly packaged DNA. It's wound around histones. Just as an interesting fact, if you were to stretch out all of the DNA in a single human nucleus, it would come to about six feet in length in total. So that just gives you some idea of how densely packaged DNA is in these, these chromosomes. And a human genome comprises about six billion bases. That's the diploid bases, so the haploid complement, that is one copy of each chromosome is obviously half that. And as I said, chromosome one is the largest. It's around 250 megabases in size. Chromosome 21 is the smallest human chromosome. It's around 50 megabases in size. DNA is made up, obviously, of four different bases, A pairs with T, G pairs with C. A very fundamental thing to recognize is that um, AT pairs are joined by two hydrogen bonds, GC pairs by three hydrogen bonds, and that has a lot of just fundamental implications for how different assays work in regions of the genome that may be, for example, very GC rich or very AT rich, because GC pairs are much more sticky than AT pairs. So up until the last year or so, when sort of the latest for example, genome sequencing methods were developed with no PCR, no amplification involved. For example, you would get dropout of very GC-rich regions of the genome because they're just very hard to amplify. So it has a lot of just fundamental implications for you know, pretty much any molecular biology you do uh, of, of genome. When we start talking about sequences of DNA, for example, in the human genome sequence that you can view, download, you only ever really need to think about one of the molecules. That's the sequence that's given because obviously knowing one strand and reverse complementarity of DNA, you automatically know the sequence of the other strands. And just to give you guys a history of the, um, how 
modern genetics has evolved, because I think when you start to think about this, it becomes obvious how rapid the progression has been in the last couple of decades in particular. DNA, the molecule itself, was first discovered in 1870. Um, here's a picture of just some isolated DNA in a tube using a sort of standard salt um, alcohol-based precipitation technique. But it took about another 70 years before anyone f even figured out that DNA was the hereditary material. Prior to that, everyone thought that proteins were the molecules through which information was transmitted between generations. Um, Watson and Crick so has discovered, really proposed, the, the double-stranded uh, helix molecule for DNA. Um, Jim Watson lives about an hour down the road from here at Cold Spring Harbor. He's getting very crusty these days, but he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's an interesting guy to have lunch with. I say in 1956, the first um, chromosome spreads were developed. Actually, the lady that I did my PhD with in the UK was around at that time doing her PhD. She loved to tell me the stories of how she would argue with her boss about she thought it was 46 and her boss thought it was 47 chromosomes that people had. So that's even just, you know, one generation from, from where we are today. In the late 70s, people first invented sequencing-based methods. This, at the time, was done using radioactive labeling. So this is the S35 labeling, I believe. I used to do this stuff way back in the day when I was a lab tech. And then in the mid-1980s, two fundamental techniques were developed um, that really sort of kick-started the revolution in molecular biology. So the first of these was PCR that enabled you to take any piece of DNA that you're interested in, amplify millions and millions of molecules of it, um, and so basically give you enough ma material to do studies on, run them on gels, things like that, sequence them. And then in addition, um, people developed fluorescent-based labeling of DNA using four different colors, and that really sped up the throughput that you could perform DNA sequencing with. But then it still took about another 10 years, so in 1995, the first organism had its genome sequenced. This was a Haemophilus influenzae, a bacteria, and so you can see that this is only just over 20 years ago that genome sequencing first even came along. So shortly after that sequencing of, of Haemophilus influenzae, it was um, a group of scientists got together and proposed that the human genome should be sequenced. The draft genome was released in 2001. This was a massive project. It took about 13 years of work, involved more than 50 different groups around the world, um, and the cost, there's various estimates floating around, but generally accepted more than a billion dollars just to do one single genome. It's, I think, important to understand how that genome was done and how that compares to how we sequence genomes these days, because it, it was very different. It was actually done in a very, very thorough way. So genomic DNA was taken, in fact, from a number of different individuals, so that the genome sequence we have now is not the sequence of one person's DNA, it's actually the sequence of several people's DNA spliced together. And in fact, you know, just one chromosome from different people spliced together. I'll, I'll tell you why that's important a bit later. But the DNA from these individuals was chopped up into very large fragments, usually on the order of about 150 to 250 KB in size, put into what we call BACs, bacterial artificial chromosomes. These are just very large vectors that enable you to grow up clones of those pieces of DNA and bacteria. Each one of those BACs, so these big chunks of DNA, was then mapped using fluorescent in situ hybridization onto chromosomes, so people knew, okay, this one comes from, you know, halfway down chromosome five, and I can order it in relation to other backs that I, I can map in the same experiment. And so people now had a map of the, what's called the contigs, how those back fragments are located in relation to each other. And then each back was then subcloned, fragmented and subcloned into much smaller pieces, you know, about a a KB in size that were then individually sequenced by random sequencing, what we call shotgun sequencing. These were then assembled to form the backs, and the backs had been already mapped to form this backbone, so you can now develop, hopefully, uh, large contigs comprising each chromosome. And this is not how we do DNA sequencing at all these days, but that's how it was done then, but it's a very good way of doing it. Even despite this incredibly laborious methodology, um, the genome is by no means finished, so if you look, for example, in the most commonly used genome assembly today, it's called HG19, so the, it's actually about the 37th assembly of the human genome. Um, there are still 271 gaps in that sequence. And this is the way it was done, so these are old ABI fluorescent sequences, I used to use these guys, you basically make a 
slab of gel sandwiched between two glass plates. Um, it's a really tricky technique. It takes a while to get good at. Run each one of these lanes here is an individual well that you load at the top. Um, you can see the four different dyes correspond to the four different bases of DNA. And you then have to analyze those uh, um, on these gel-based methods manually, um, extract the sequence, and then this is what's basically here assembled back into the genome. So incredibly laborious. Yeah? Very good question. So there are specific projects being done to try and fill in some of these gaps. Um, so I actually did a postdoc in, in one of the labs that's sort of dedicated to doing that. But it's almost a sort of either unsolvable or, or redundant question. Um, as I mentioned, the, the human genome reference sequence that everyone uses was made from DNA derived from multiple different people. And so there are some places where you know, you'll be sequencing this way from person A, sequencing this way from person B, and you get to a point where person A has something grossly different to person B. There's rearrangements, inversions, bits missing, bits added in, which I'll tell you about in a bit. And it's simply impossible to join those two things together in a way that makes sense. It's like trying getting two different jigsaw puzzles and trying to fit them. They just don't fit. So there are some places that are gaps in the genome as a result of the fact that we sequence different people's DNA and try to mix, splice it together. Um, there are other projects going on, so probably in the next one to two years, I would guess. Um, a variety of different groups are constructing what they sort of call platinum genomes, so new human genomes um, that are probably be better quality than the current human genome reference. And that's being done using long read technologies, things like PacBio, stuff like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, how the human genome reference evolves, if it stays the same. My guess is it may well do, but I'm, I'm not sure. Because there's a lot of advantages to using human genome reference. I can say I coordinate, and anyone else in the world knows exactly what bit of DNA I'm talking about, for example. Um, but yeah, very good question. And yeah, if anyone else has thoughts as we go along, often a lot of the, the best learning experience, I, I think, come from you know, asking little points like that. So if you want to look up the, the sequence of the human genome, or in fact any of the other several hundred organisms that have now had their DNA sequenced, there's two main resources. One is uh, uh, run by um, the European Bioinformatics Institute in the UK at the Sanger Center. I actually prefer, despite the fact that I'm British, I prefer the American version, run from UCSC. This is a screenshot of their genome browser. Here's just a very simple window here, I'm actually showing the individual backs that were originally sequenced. It was originally called the Golden Path because these used to be colored yellow and that's the name for it. But you can switch on hundreds of different tracks showing you, in this case, we switched on where CG dinucleotides are. These are sites that can be methylated, epigenetically modified. Here we're showing a gene, cystic fibrosis gene, and regions of DNA that are predicted to be uh, regulatory in nature. But there are, if I was to expand this, this would go probably down below to the next floor of all the different bits of information in the genome that are annotated that you can look at and download. And I'll be teaching you guys how to utilize that and analyze it next week. So as I said, the, the draft human genome was published in 2001. Um, and then this paper came out in 2004, where after another three years of work, they said, you know, we're, we're pretty much finished. But that was 12 years ago now. But like I said, the human genome that we have today is neither finished and by no means perfect, as we've already discussed a little bit. As I said, there's, you know, hundreds of gaps still in, in the current human genome reference. We're now up to, like I say, build, they keep changing the nomenclature. This one was called HG19. It was also called Build 37. For some reason, they've now decided to change it to HG38. Not sure why, but it's basically the 38th version of the human genome. So basically, as more and more data keeps being gathered by different groups who are trying to close gaps, do things like that, every so often, a new build of the human genome, a new version will be released. And supposedly, this one is, is better than the last one, but it's actually fairly poorly annotated at this point. HG19 is usually the assembly that most people use at this point. And a really important thing to consider and, and to know about is that whenever you're working in the genome, you always need to know which build of the genome are you working in, is somebody else working in, if you get some data from somebody else. They may have worked in HG18 or you know, HG38 or something and, and may give you a set of coordinates which may not at all correspond to what you think they are. And just to illustrate that, 
here are just some statistics on chromosome 1. So in HD18, chromosome 1 was listed as about 247 meg in size. The next build of, H, uh, of, uh, of the, the assembly, HG19, suddenly chromosome 1 had about 2 megabases of extra sequence added on, mysteriously. And then in the following build, the more recent one, it shrunk by about 300 KB. Just so it's clear, all of the chromosomes are numbered from base number 1, which is always the top of the peon, down through to base N. So in the case of you know, chromosome 1, the bottom of that in the latest assembly will have this coordinate here. But basically what that means is, you know, if you're working particularly with a gene that's down here, it's really important to know which of these builds you're working in because its coordinates can change by plus or minus two megabase between different builds. And so if you're working in things like the UCSC Genome Browser, number one place to check before you ever start looking anything up, which build am I being shown? And yeah, I've worked on projects where people have wasted like a month of work because they got sent a set of coordinates by a collaborator, did a whole bunch of work, get to the end and like, that's weird, I'm not seeing as much as I thought I should, and then check, and they're like, oh yeah, my collaborator sent me the coordinates in a different build, and I guarantee if you're doing stuff, you will make that mistake too, at least once. But yeah, always be aware of what build of genomes you're working in. If you ever do want to work between different builds, so like I say, you're doing some work and you're using HG19, and a friend of yours is using an older build or a newer build, they send you coordinates. Luckily, there are very easy tools called Liftover, um, you can access these um, either as a command line function, you can download the scripts, or directly uh, you know, through the UCSC Genome Browser. You can just plug in your coordinates. You say, this is the build I'm working in. I want output coordinates in this build, and it will instantly convert those for you. You can even do it between different organisms. So say I throw in a set of genes in mouse, and I say, tell me the syntenic genes in human, it will do that too. Although you ha always have to be aware the further away you go, the more differences there will be. And some things won't lift over because we have genes that, some genes that mouse doesn't, vice versa, things like that. So it's not always perfect, but at least in human, you know, 99% of the time you lift things over from one build to another, you'll get a perfect match. If you actually dig into HG19, I start off by telling you humans have 24 different chromosomes, and you look at the list of what are called chromosomes, you actually find that there are 93 different things listed. So what the hell's going on here? So you can see that there are, you know, the ones we expect, chromosome 1, chromosome 2, 3, 4. But then you notice that every chromosome has this bin called chromosome 1 random, you know, chromosome 4 random. These are bits of sequence that in the original back mapping efforts that were done way back, you know, 15 years ago, people using fluorescent in-situ hybridization knew that this sequence came from chromosome 1 somewhere on it. But then when they did the assembly and tried to stitch these bits of sequence together, they couldn't make it fit. But they knew it was from chromosome 1 because you can see that when you hybridize that DNA to a mitotic spread. So there are these random bits of DNA floating around that can't anchor, but we know which chromosome they're on. There are other bits of DNA that we have no idea where they come from. We think they're human, but they don't join with anything. So there's all these chromosome unknowns. You see most of these are fairly short. And then what's happening now in the more recent genome assemblies that people uh, are being made is typically it's regions that are gaps. So for example, very highly variable bits of our genome, where if you were to take you know, everyone in this room, everyone might have a different configuration of DNA there. So things like the HLA gene cluster, immunoglobulin gene cluster, um, some other crazy bits of DNA we have. And so different versions of these bits of DNA have been assembled and released as what are called alternate haplotypes. They usually have this hap and a number uh, suffix. So this is all really important to know because if you are doing things like sequence mapping, bioinformatics, things that you were just learning about and we'll be told a lot more about next week, um, it makes a really big difference um, what you're mapping to. Sorry, I thought I had another slide here. Because if you're... For example, you just take everything here that's in HG19, you may find certain genes are, <coughs> are listed multiple times just because they're present in multiple different haplotypes. Doesn't mean to say you have six different copies of, say, an HLA gene. It may be listed, or in fact, seven different times. It's just they've provided us seven different haplotypes that are segregating in the population. It may be a unique single copy gene, but if, say, you map uh, your reads to everything here, um, and say, I only believe reads that map to a single place, it all may get thrown out because 
you haven't appreciated what is in the, you know, one of these builds of the human genome. And just to illustrate that more, here's an example of one of these alternate haplotype lo loci. <coughs> this is a region on chromosome 5 called the spinal muscular atrophy locus. The original haplotype that was assembled looked something like this. I'll tell you more about what segmental duplications are in a bit. And then this is actually a figure taken from the original paper where they sequenced chromosome 5. They actually went in back into the back libraries, picked out all the other clones they could map into this region, reassembled them. So it's presumably the second chromosome in there. And when you take this same region, assemble it from a different chromosome, you basically end up with a bit of sequence that's about a megabase shorter. So that means even two chromosomes within one person, within one chunk of DNA on chromosome 5, can differ in size by a megabase. Even though they have very related structures, these lines here are basically showing you the structural relationships between these two uh, different haplotypes. You can see there's all kinds of inversions, rearrangements going on. And this is why when you say closing gaps, you can see, so you march in here from this end, here from this end, another haplotype, and you just get lost in the middle. And yeah, so as I said, if, you're, if you don't appreciate that there are, say, seven different alternate haplotypes for the HLA locus, if I was to take the HLA gene, one of them, and I say in UCSC genome browser, where are you in the HG19, it says, it's here. Actually, it's a unique gene. It maps to a single place on chromosome 6, but because there are all these different haplotypes, it says, oh, it maps here on this haplotype, here on this haplotype, here on this haplotype. And I say that's really important when you're just doing basic bioinformatic tasks of like read mapping, things like that. If you throw in all of these haplotypes, it's going to be a real mess. So you have choices to make. This is just a fun little fact here, too, something that comes out from uh, looking at the genome browser. So uh, have, have anyone here heard of the pseudo-autosomal regions on the sex chromosomes? Yeah. So these are uh, regions on the tips of the X and Y chromosomes. As their name suggests, behave in an autosomal manner. So they undergo um, obligatory recombination during meiosis. The sequences of, of, of there's about a 2.7 megabase chunk on the tip of X and Y. The short arms that's identical. It's called pseudo autosomal region one. There's a smaller region on the uh, XQ tip. And for a long time, that wasn't that well mapped. But if you look at uh, uh, just in the genome assembly, there are these tracks here called mappability. This is just an effort where people have said, how unique is this piece of sequence? If I have a read, can I map it uniquely to this bit of DNA or not? And as a a quirk of the way this was done, it actually perfectly maps the boundary of the pseudo-autosomal region. Because in these particular ones where they say, I'll take a 50 mer and ask how many places in the genome does it map, you suddenly see right here, it goes from mapping almost uniquely to having a score of 0.5, meaning it mapped to two different places. I, here it maps uniquely on the X. Any bits left of here map to both the X and the Y. So there's the boundary of the pseudo-autosomal region. Interestingly, if you look at this other mappability track produced by a different group, you don't see that. And that was simply a fact of these guys didn't consider the Y. So they only considered chromosome 1 through 22 plus X. These guys threw in the entire genome, and so they see it. So again, this is a good general thing to know. There are always choices when you're doing bioinformatics, genome analysis, and just a simple thing of what you include when you're doing your read mapping can have a huge difference on what comes out the end. All right, so we're going to dig a bit more into the, the quirks and features of the human genome here. This is a graph that was produced in the middle of 2000 from a meeting that's been going on now for about 20 years at Cold Spring Harbor every May. I was actually there uh, just uh, last month. And at the time, this was a meeting of all the, the people who were involved in the human genome mapping project, so, you know, the, the world experts on the human genome. And what they did at this meeting, this was a year prior to actually finishing the draft assembly, was they said, let's take a poll and I want everyone to guess how many genes there are in the human genome. And so this is showing the results of that poll. The most popular answer was around 60,000. One person thought there was maybe as few as 25,000. One person thought there was probably going to be about 150,000 genes. If you actually look in uh, RefSeq, which is a fairly conservative uh, uh, definition of genes, it currently lists about 18,500 genes. So this was a real surprise. Like I say, this was just prior to the human genome draft assembly was made. Nobody thought that humans would have this few genes. If ever you look in data from other projects, things like GenCode or Ensemble, they will come out with slightly more permissive answers, you know, maybe 21,000. 
Other estimates maybe are 25,000, things like that. But it's basically just to illustrate that we don't even really know how many genes humans have. It partly depends on how you define them. What is a gene? Is it protein coding? Is it, could it be something else that just makes an RNA but doesn't make a protein? And again, there are choices on how you define even such basic questions as that. It was a real surprise when uh, the human draft genome was first made, and even if you took the most permissive thresholds, that it was decided humans you know, maybe have 20 to 25,000 genes. A couple of years prior to that, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is this little mustard weed in the corner over there, had been sequenced. Its genome is about 3% uh, the size of the human genome, only about 100 uh, um, million base pairs in size. That's the haploid complement. And so everyone thought, well, this little plant has 25,000, human genome is 30 times bigger, we must have maybe 150,000 genes. And so that was a real shock, particularly as um, we as humans like to think ourselves as very superior to plants. There's George Bush just showing his superiority of that piece of corn. You know, this was a, a real big shock to people. One of the implications of that is, therefore, that if we have about the same number of genes as some of these other sort of, you know, lower, quote unquote, organisms, but a lot more DNA in our genomes, that means that there must be a much lower density of genes overall, i.e. a lot more stuff going on either between the genes or, or gaps within the genes than some of these other organisms. So as I said, if you try and ask the question, how many genes are there in a human genome, you can come up with various features that you would say, this is what a gene looks like. You know, if it makes a protein, it must have what we call a, an open reading frame, i.e. the triplets do not have stop codons littered throughout them, things like that. Maybe you could say, well, genes are usually spliced, so there must be introns and there must be exons. Most genes will have promoters with certain features I can recognize. They're polyadenylated, blah, 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 blah. You can come up with lots of rules. But we now understand that many of these things are not, you know, 100%. There are variations around them. The human genome is littered with things like pseudogenes. So these are typically thought to be where a gene was made into an RNA, and at some point it got re-spliced back into the the genome, either with or without introns included in that. Most people generally think those are non-functional, but there's now several examples of those pseudogenes that are functional. We now know things like, you know, non-coding RNAs that in many cases are definitely functional. Uh, microRNAs, you know, long non-coding RNAs. So even though you could say, well, you know, there's 20, 21,000 protein coding genes, you add some of these things up together, you can get a much bigger number. But again, it, it's very hard to put your finger on. Our genome is large, and we have a, a similar number of, of genes to, say, you know, Arabidopsis, but a much larger genome. So what is the rest of our DNA doing? Because, you know, if we consider the protein coding content, it's only around 1, 1.5% 1 of our DNA. So that leaves at least 99% of our, our genome that is not protein coding. Well, it turns out if you compare the genome of humans to other organisms that have been sequenced, you can identify quite large tracts in some cases that look almost identical even as far back uh, to, say, fish. So these can be sometimes stretches of, of DNA, hundreds or even thousands of base pairs in size that have basically gone unchanged throughout very large periods of evolution. And the fact that they're conserved therefore suggests that probably they're doing something important. So for example, you can take the genome of, of coelacanth. This is this very sort of primitive fish that lives deep in the Indian Ocean. If you go back in fossil records, it's estimated that there's about half a billion years of evolutionary history separating or, or since our last common ancestor. And if you just do some calculations, that's enough time for every base in our DNA to have mutated several times over. So random mutation would say that the genome of coelacanth, if nothing it was important, should look nothing like the genome of human because everything, in theory, should have mutated if it didn't matter. But in fact, if you compare, and again, this is a track from the UCSC Genome Browser, if you compare human DNA here to various other organisms, so we've got horse, you know, lizards, chickens, yeah, stickleback fish, we don't have the coelacanth, but sticklebacks are, are getting there. Here we're looking at a section of um, chromosome sorry, two. You can see that, as you might expect, there are protein coding regions that are highly conserved, but there are even other regions outside of protein coding regions that are more highly conserved in some cases than the genes themselves. And this therefore suggests, because of this high degree of conservation, these are probably important bits of DNA 
and the idea is that uh, most of them are probably going to be regulatory in nature. So dictating you know, when a gene is switched on or off, what level it's expressed at, maybe uh, dictating epigenetic interactions and things in that region. Having genome sequences of, of many different organisms has actually revolutionized the sort of field of, of figuring out the, the family trees of different animals. So that in many cases, genome sequencing has sort of really changed people's viewpoints on how different animals are related to each other. And, and people have built these molecular phylogenies that have dated basically pretty accurately, you know, when different splits occurred in, in, in the mammalian lineage. And you can use things like this and also other studies just within human populations to estimate that the mutation rate of our genome is probably something in the order of around 2 to 2.5 uh, times 10 to the minus 8 uh, bases per generation. That might sound a weird statistic, but basically if you multiply that by about 6 billion, the number of letters in or, or bases in the human genome, that gives you an estimate of maybe like 100 to 150 new mutations at each human generation. And so that's, you know, fundamentally important because, as I'll tell you in a bit, when you start sequencing people's genomes, often when we're doing sort of disease uh, studies, you know, we may have a child that comes into a genetic clinic with a congenital disease that you think is, is genetic in nature. Neither of their parents has that disease, so you might be looking for a new mutation, a de novo event in their genome that neither parent carries. But now, based on this, we know, well, everyone, all of us in this room probably carries, you know, 100 or more new mutations that neither of our parents had. So it gives you just a framework to say, okay, if I find a new mutation in somebody's DNA, is that unexpected? Well, everyone carries them. So makes our job a little bit harder. Now, another really important thing to understand about the human genome and, and uh, the genome of most higher organisms is that there is a lot of other stuff too. So I've told you about genes, I've told you about conserve regions, but in fact, the majority of our genome almost is made up of repetitive elements. So common repeats, they're often called. A good way of thinking about these is that these are mostly uh, relics of viruses, retroviruses that over the last few million years of evolution have basically at some point inserted their genome into our DNA, maybe been shut down by our, our, our sort of uh, genome sort of defense mechanisms and don't go away. They're still sitting there. Yeah? Uh, was there, how many of these retrovirus, like, of, of like retrovirus sequences and um, food get that don't cause disease but they change the genome throughout the whole lifespan? So you're asking is the somatic retroviral insertions or, or transposons? Yes, that's a really interesting question. So there's a few recent papers that have suggested, for example, in the brain there may be spikes in activity in the developing brain of transposons. So if you take sequence of individual neurons, there will be mosaicism. So you'll have some neurons in your brain that have a repeat that's jumped in new that is missing in other parts. Um, I'm not sure that's that well pinned down right now, but yeah, it's something that people are starting to think may be a source of, you know, uh, in, intra-individual genetic diversity almost. Is it possible people can literally just, you know, catch a retrovirus uh, from somebody else that won't cause overt symptoms and they cause clinical expansion, or is it really not known yet? Um, well, we certainly know, I mean, some cancers, you know, HIV is a retrovirus. It inserts into our DNA and some cells in the body. That uh, obviously causes disease. But yeah, some cancers, things like HPV again, um, that is associated with cervical cancer. Or um, there, are also, there are also many studies that show that. There are recent studies that show that integration events over time have led to almost a fine tuning of our transcriptional response given these elements that these viruses contain when they stick it so they can present you, you, you unique yeah, yeah. there's some examples of side elements and things that have been co-opted to form part of new transcripts you know, in recent evolution or regulatory elements and things. So, so yeah, the, the sort of old-fashioned name for these things was junk DNA, but as I say, there's an emerging view that that's maybe a bit of a misnomer. Probably the vast majority of these are, is just stuff that hangs around in our, our, our genome literally just junk that's thrown in and then is never gotten rid of, but some of it probably is doing important things too. And if you think, just as an aside, there's, there's some plant genomes that when you look at their genomes, they can be, I think, 
that's sometimes 100 times larger than the human genome, and they're composed, you know, 90-something percent purely of just transposon stuff. And that then begs the question, like, they're spending a lot of energy <laughs> manufacturing millions of copies of stuff that they don't need. Like, why is that? Again, you can view these transposons. Um, so they come in various different classes. So large subgrouping sign stands for short interspersed nuclear element, line, long interspersed nuclear element. LTR is uh, long terminal repeat and other kinds. And these are very easy to recognize. There are packages, things like repeat mask that you can just throw some sequence into and it'll annotate where these are. But just looking at this, you can see that basically our genome is completely littered with these things. Each one of these little tick marks is saying here is a, at least a fragment of, of one of these repeats. Interesting, you'll notice that right here, this bit I'm showing you, there's a distinct gap or a sort of lack of repeats. There's literally only a, a couple of these guys have jumped into this region about 100 KB. And that contrasts very starkly with the bits around it. So you may go, huh, you know, what's going on there? Well, it turns out this is one of these Hox gene loci that I just showed you that uh, uh, has a lot of conservation through evolutionary time. And you may say, well, why are there no repeats that are jumping in here? The answer is sometimes they do, but then this is what happens. And this, again, gives you some insight into conservation because clearly there are some bits of our genome that are fundamental to just body patterning. You can see it doesn't really matter if you're a human or a mouse or a chicken or a fish. If you have a thing, something, a mutation that disrupts this region, not only the protein coding regions, but the way uh, the regulatory elements uh, and the structure of the region, you can have some pretty serious consequences. Starting to get there. So one other thing I want to tell you guys about is a class of DNA element or, or feature of our genome that we call segmental duplications. So I just told you about common repeats, things like lines and signs, but there are other generally much, much larger pieces of our DNA that are non-unique in nature. Some of these can be up to about half a megabase in size in some cases, and the term segmental duplication is basically a name that says there is a piece of DNA annotated here by this blue block that maybe has a twin somewhere else. It could be on the same chromosome, in which case we call it an intra-chromosomal duplication, or it could be a uh, a, a chunk of DNA that has a, a friend on another chromosome, an interchromosomal duplication that basically looks almost the same as it. So most of these chunks of DNA that at some point have presumably been copied and then duplicated, inserted either on the same or another chromosome, presumably through some sort of meiotic error or something at some point, most of these are pretty large. For reasons we don't fully understand, a lot seem to have accumulated during primate evolution which means you know, they're typically less than 20 million or so years old in evolutionary terms. And the implication here is that because they haven't had a lot of time typically to accumulate mutations between them, they typically look very similar to each other. So mostly more than 90% identical. And apart from that, these pieces of DNA just look like any regular piece of DNA. Some have genes in them, and they'll have common repeats, lines and signs, you know, regulatory elements. So there's nothing special, it's just a piece of DNA that has an, another bit in our genome that looks very similar. In total, about 5% of our genome is made up of these duplicated chunks. And you may say, okay, that's great, why do I care? Here is a map of those. What you'll notice is there are certain chromosomes, sorry, the annotation is slightly offset. This is chromosome seven, this is chromosome nine. There are certain chromosomes that are very rich here in these segmental duplications. Here I'm just showing you in the dark blue is the intra-chromosomal, so within the same chromosome. And just the annotation here is basically these blue lines are saying a piece of DNA here looks just like a piece of DNA over here. And you'll notice that a lot of them tend to occur around centromeric regions or telomeric regions. If I then add on the interchromosomal events, kind of looks like a spider on crack or something that tried to make a web, you can kind of get an idea that our genome has a pretty crazy structure. So there's this sort of higher order structure where Different telomeres look just like each other. Different centromeres and the regions around them, the pericentromeric regions, will look like each other. And there's basically this history of DNA moving around our genome and inserting somewhere else that's been going on over the last you know, few million years of evolution. Yeah? These areas of replication, do you see like, different like, replication patterns on them or different, different locations around them? Good question. They're actually really hard to study. Because, you know, for example, a piece of DNA, let's say here, may look 98% of the same as a piece of DNA there. So now you sequence it with, say, a 100 base pair read, 
And what that's going to mean is there are only two base pairs in the 100 base pair read on average that are different between the two. And it can be almost impossible to tell when you get a sequence read, does it come from here or does it come from here? Particularly if you're now talking about bisulfite sequencing where you've reduced complexity. Can you just do the area of the Sorry? Can you just do the area of the in between these? But then you don't get information on it. <laughs> So yeah, the, these bits of the genome are a pig to study in many cases, um, just because all the short read technologies, array technologies, don't touch them in most cases. Um, and again, when we talk about things like gaps in the genome, you find a really strong correlation between duplicated regions that have gaps in the assembly that are structurally variable within the population because they themselves have a predisposition to undergo further rearrangements. So yeah, so the genome is not just a linear strand of DNA that A, T, Cs, and Gs. There is common repeats. There are these large segmental duplication blocks. There's complexity. And certain portions of our genome are just really hard to study as a result of this. Like I say, you get a sequence read from a recent line event. It may map to a 1,000 different places in your genome. And so it's just really hard to know what you're looking at half the time. Now again, why does this matter? apart from it makes our life hard when we're trying to look at the genome in certain instances. Well, it actually has some pretty fundamental um, implications for genome rearrangements, <coughs> and uh, in many cases, genome rearrangements that cause disease. So here I'm just showing you a cartoon of um, a pair of human chromosomes at meiosis. So these blue blocks here is a pair of highly identical duplications on a chromosome. ABC is just three genes in an intervening sequence. And normally in meiosis, chromosomes should align equally with each other. So when, when crossing over happens, there's no gain loss of material. You're just shuffling it, but without deleting or duplicating something. But when you have now have places in our genome that look almost the same as each other over maybe 100, 200 KB, what that means is if the alignment of those chromosomes at meiosis is not quite equal, you can have illegitimate recombination happening. It should happen between here and here, or here and here, but actually it's happening between these blocks of duplicated sequence that are offset. And if you follow these lines through, what you'll end up with is a gamete that's got now a double dose of ABC and another gamete that's completely lost genes ABC. Or in some cases, you can just get inversion, so it would now be CBA, flipped around. And so this actually happens a lot in our genome as a result of this. We now have about 40 different, um, what are typically called recurrent genomic disorders that are all caused because of this underlying mechanism, where there are bits of DNA with these chunks of duplicated sequence that undergo uh, basically frequent errors of recombination. Here's an example of just one of these. This is a region on chromosome 15. Um, it undergoes very frequent rearrangement, probably on the order of about one per 1,500 meiosis. You get something going wrong here. These are these blocks of duplicated sequence. Um, basically, you know, this orange bar is saying this piece of DNA looks the same as this piece that looks the same as this piece. This is another way of viewing it. Again, these lines joining pieces of identical sequence. And what I'm showing you here is results of uh, a, a method called array CGH, where you can look at DNA copy number, and you find multiple unrelated people that have all lost exactly the same piece of DNA because of this illegitimate recombination. It turns out this recurrent deletion here is one of the most common genetic causes of epilepsy we know about. Um, there's a gene here called Cherna 7 within this recurrent deletion region that's uh, an ion channel expressed in the brain. So we're going to start talking a bit about variation in the genome. And when we start thinking about genetic variation, it's good to start at a, just a, a high level and consider the different types, the spectrum of genetic variations that occur. So on the one extreme, we have uh, uh, changes that affect a single nucleotide, uh, single base pair changes or point mutations. On the other end of the spectrum, we have very, very large events. These are things that you'd pick up by looking down the light microscope. So things that, you know, where two chromosomes swap over, uh, a translocation occurs, a large inversion. Or you could even think of things like trisomy, Down syndrome, as a genetic variation. It causes disease, but it's a variation. And then in between, we have a, a spectrum of different things, so things that we uh, typically call copy number variations, deletions and duplications of chunks of DNA. I've talked a bit about um, retro elements, you know, transposons. Those can jump around differently between or even within individuals. And then there are also just small events of, you know, a handful of bases where something may get chopped in or deleted out, things like that. 
we now have good maps of common genetic variation in the human genome. Again, all of this data is available in, for example, the UCSC Genome Browser. So here we've now switched on a track um, from the HapMap project showing all these SNPs found in that survey of genetic variation in, in the human genome. You can view that if you zoom in and you start to get annotation here in the Genome Browser. So these are now colored. Green ones are variants that occur in protein-coded regions but don't change in amino acids, so synonymous. Red ones are variants that do change in amino acids, so non-synonymous variants. Um, there we go. And as I say, uh, I'll talk uh, uh, more about this in a bit, but there are a couple of major projects that have been completed in, in the last sort of 10 years since the human genome mapping project was done. First one was called HapMap, and the second one called the Thousand Genomes Project that basically made comprehensive maps of genetic variation in human populations. And these are important for a, a couple of different reasons. First, they give us this, this map of uh, 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 where variations are. And this is important for looking at disease because if we've now profiled variation in the normal population, we can now start to define much better variations that may occur specifically in disease that are, are probably pathogenic in nature. And as I'll tell you in a minute, this has actually given us insight to many different things. So it's allowed things like genome-wide association studies to be done. It's given us insight into human migrations over history, um, insight into evolution and selection that's going on in our genomes, and also just fundamentals of how recombination is occurring. So I'm just going to talk a bit about some of those different um, um, highlights down here and start off with recombination. So recombination is obviously the how chromosomes uh, uh, cross over, recombine during meiosis, and shuffle our genetic material between generations. But this is not a random process. So here I'm just showing you a map of um, chromosome 12, and the y-axis is basically at different points along the chromosome showing the frequency with which recombination occurs in a large population, the, these black lines here. And the key point is that you see there's some places where there's big spikes saying recombination happens here a lot. And then there are other places where there's a trough saying recombination basically barely ever happens at that point on the chromosome. And now that we have maps of genetic variation in populations within families, we can actually define at the molecular level where these recombination events occur just by tracking uh, chromosomes through a pedigree and asking where is there a flip of the two parental chromosomes that were inherited by a child. Again, you can view these things in the genome browser. So here is a map of what we call linkage disequilibrium, or LD. And what you'll notice basically is that there, there are these red triangles that indicate essentially in a sort of heat map form how often recombination occurs. So red, oh sorry, let me rephrase that. How related variant, genetic variants along our chromosome, how, how correlated with each other they are. Sorry, it's the reverse. I find it the term linkage disequilibrium horrible. Whoever invented it, it's like a double negative. And another way of thinking about it that's perhaps a little more uh, easier to wrap your head around is basically where you have these red triangles where you see a gap between different triangles. That is a place in the genome where a recombination hotspot occurs. So it's basically saying, you know, this heat map, everything within this red triangle is highly correlated with each other. So there may be a genetic variant here that always within a population or nearly always tracks with the genetic variant here. In contrast, if I have a variant here and then cross over to another triangle, so I cross over one of these hotspots, it's basically unrelated. I have zero predictive power if I have a SNP here to what the SNP in here may be, but I may have very high predictive power if I genotype a SNP here to what the SNP in the same LD block is. These gaps between the triangles are these recombination hotspots. Conversely, the, you know, the red triangles are recombination cold spots, places where through recent human evolution, uh, recombination is very, very, or, or never happened and does not separate the alleles that are segregating in the population. And I say the official term for this is linkage disequilibrium. And, and then we call these triangles, if you like, LD blocks. Uh, is anyone else confused? Or hopefully I did a reasonable job of explaining that. Okay, so if we now take these patterns of, of linkage disequilibrium, and now, instead of just viewing uh, the one track that I showed you here, the, the sharp-eyed ones, we'll notice this was in Chinese and Japanese, so Asian individuals, you can make the same maps based on genetic information here. This is in Africans, this is in Europeans, and this is the one we were just looking at in, in Asians. 
and it's just flipped the other way. It does some, you can choose the way you display it, either inverted or not. But what you'll see is that in these, if you like, sort of ethnically older populations, from sort of the out of Africa hypothesis, that the LD blocks typically are much more sort of diffuse than they are in some of the sort of uh, uh, more isolated populations and are often much smaller than we get in, in for example, Europeans or, or Asians. And this is basically a consequence of the fact that, you know, individuals who live, for example, in, you know, northwestern Europe or in, you know, Japan typically would derive from a, a relatively small number of founder individuals who are population bottlenecks and have had less evolutionary time since that population were, was established for their chromosomes to be shuffled through meiosis. So what's the um, it's basically, that's a good question. It, it's basically a function of the size of LD blocks. So the y-axis doesn't actually really mean anything. It's just, if you think about this as a correlation matrix, it's sort of put on the diagonal. So if you follow a line from here to here and you have a red block here, it's saying that piece of DNA right here, come back this way, is highly related to this piece of DNA here. So the y-axis don't think really means much. It's just if the, all the LD blocks were tiny, it would be shorter. It's more the color you're looking at. So deep red means highly correlated. White or pale blue means not very correlated at all. So yeah, in these sort of older populations which have had more time to shuffle their DNA through evolution, you get these smaller, more diffuse LD blocks. In the younger populations, you get these larger, stronger blocks of LD. And again, you may say, why do I care about this? Well, it's a really important um, idea to wrap your head around when you start thinking about studies like genome-wide association studies, linkage, things like that. And the fact that we can define bits of our genome that through evo uh, recent human evolution have not undergone uh, recombination, like I said, it fundamentally means if I genotype a SNP here, if I know that this LD block is, you know, th there's never been any uh, recombination in, I genotype the variant here, I can predict with, you know, 98% certainty what the genotype of, of SNP there is in the same person, because I know they've never been separated since, you know, the last 50,000 years. So what that means is, is that when you come to do things like a genome-wide association study where you want to assess the genetic variation in an individual, you don't actually need to genotype every SNP because there's redundancy. I can just genotype one or two what we call tag SNPs in this region. And I don't need to bother genotyping the rest because once I've done one or two of them, I can predict what the other ones are. And so this idea has basically led to, you know, how companies like Illumina and Affymetrics were able to produce genotyping arrays that can, you know, assess the large amount of common variation in our genomes only through genotyping a subset of the variants that we actually have. So it means you don't need to genotype everything, you can just genotype you know, maybe 10 or 20% of our SNPs and you still know nearly all the information. So they basically just select what are called tag SNPs, or SNPs that have high predictive power located within each different LD block, and then you basically can impute predict the, the, the other genetic variants within those same LD blocks based on the genotypes of those key tag SNPs. And I say that's basically what's allowed you know, large-scale GWAS to be done. Having maps of common genetic variation enables you to do some really other interesting things. So, you know, people have now taken these maps and asked, where is selection occurring in human genomes? This here is data from the, the HapMap project where it's showing the frequency of a particular variant in this gene here and showing within different human populations from different points around the planet, what's the frequency of the derived allele, um, in this case a, a, it's a G to an A variant, and how common that is in these different populations. And what you'll see is that basically I in populations as you come out of Africa and go generally more northern latitudes in Europe, this, fr this SNP that's very rare in African populations or in other uh, populations, you know, uh, away from the equator becomes quite common. And it turns out this gene here, SLC24A5, the particular variant in question, creates an amino acid change in this gene that showed one of the strongest signatures of positive selection in the human genome. And it's really interesting because this particular gene is one that's expressed in melanosomes, that's the uh, pigmentary cells in your skin, 
And this variant is associated with change in skin, skin pigmentation. So, you know, typically human populations that live close to the equator have darker skin. That's a good thing because it protects you against sunburn. Um, you don't get cancer and die. In contrast, as populations moved out of Africa towards more northern latitudes, that's not so much of a problem. And in fact, there's more of a selective pressure to make sufficient amounts of vitamin D. And so the idea, it's not proven, is that basically this particular variant has undergone positive selection to be selected in, in uh, extremes of latitude as a result of this selective pressure of, of sunlight. Yeah. Um, why is that variation uh, not very frequent in the northern latitude and uh, the eastern in Asia? Northern Asia? Um, good question. I have no idea. <laughs> As I say, that's the kind of reading into the story, I'd say. It's you know, not proof, but it's the, the one variant that shows the sort of strongest signatures of selection in the genome. Some of the other ones, you can come up with similar stories of why that may be. So there are other, other genes that show, in fact, signatures of recurrent independent selective events. One is lactase. So as, again, you know, people started developing dairy farming, and being able to digest milk is a strong selective pressure. So there are variants in the lactase, that ha uh, lactase gene that have recurrently occurred and risen to high frequencies that mean that adults keep um, producing lactase. You can digest lactose in milk and not get sick from it. Because in people without that, you produce it as a baby, but then switch that gene off as you grow up. And then there's other ones with the opposite that are common in Africa. One in this large gene that is known to provide you protection against certain diseases that are endemic in Africa but don't exist in other countries that have, you know, gone to low frequency. Um, personally, it could just be mosaicism, <laughs> it's my personal view. Um, so yeah, it's a, I don't know if you work at Sinai or, yeah. Yeah, so th it's not quite the same topic, but what he's describing um, is a project where that's going on at Sinai where there's a lot of large-scale genotyping and sequencing of tens of thousands of individuals to try and find individuals who are carriers of mutations that we know should be causing a disease, in this case using Mendelian disorders, you know, that you would recognize, but these individuals are unaffected. Um, and so it's a bit of a different topic, but you're basically asking what's my thought on, on that. My personal opinion is, that, like I say, it could all just be mosaicism. You test somebody's blood, there may be a somatic mutation that may have occurred. You see the mutation in blood, but let's say it's muscular dystrophy and it's not in the muscles or something. Um, I don't think that's been ruled out for any of the mutations that were eventually characterized by that project. But maybe Eric wouldn't like me for saying that, but that's my opinion. <laughs> and yeah, and you can do other interesting things with SNP data too. This is actually a, a, a an interesting story. So this was a paper that was uh, 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 basically looked at recombination hotspots and said, OK, we can map recombination hotspots from SNP data. Is there some common feature of the DNA sequence of these hotspots? And so they just took all of the hotspots in the genome, you know, kind of did a, a multiple sequence alignment, a motif search, and identified this motif, a 13 base pair consensus motif that was massively enriched in uh, occurring towards the center of recombination hotspots. And it's present in about half of all recombination hotspots in the human genome. And presumably the idea is this is perhaps you know, a, a binding site for some protein that's important in initiating or carrying out recombination in some way. So a few years later, after that discovery, these three papers then came out where they took the, uh, the exact idea I just said is that maybe it's a binding site for a protein. And all three of these papers by different methods converged on the same answer that there's this protein called PRDM9 that is basically the major determinant of a recombination in mammals 
and that indeed binds to this consensus motif and initiates and carries out recombination in the mammalian genome. And it's actually a really cool story because this gene has this zinc finger motif that itself is highly variable, this tandem repeat. If you've ever heard Alec Jeffries give a talk on it, it's a really interesting topic of how recombination is sort of um, constantly evolving due to the nature of this gene. Okay, where are we on time? We've got a little bit of time. So maybe another 10 minutes before we take a break or so. So I just want to talk about, I guess, historically, some of the older ways which people use genetic variations to, to start studying disease. So if we imagine a pedigree here, a four-generation family, where we have a Mendelian disorder in it, we can use things like linkage, that is studying genetic variation within this family, to basically identify a chromosomal region where a disease gene presumably lies. And linkage simply relies on the fact that recombinations happen at every meiosis and shuffle our chromosomes in a way that is essentially random. And if we simply track the individuals that carry a disease versus the individuals that don't, so if people aren't used to looking at pedigrees, black typically or shaded symbol typically signifies affected, unshaded is unaffected individuals. And if our hypothesis is that here is the original or founder person we have, and let's say the mutation occurred on their black chromosome, if we type genetic variants along that, those chromosomes, we can then say, well, we can map where recombination occurs, and presumably there was transmission of the disease-causing variant from this female to her son, but recombination shuffled these two chromosomes right here, so now we know that the disease-causing variant doesn't occur in this end piece, because that's where the, re the recombination occurred. We do the same in the next generation, and we can basically track it down by mapping these recombination events and saying the disease allele must occur in this piece of chromosome because that's the only piece of chromosome that's common to everybody that has the disease. So it's a very simple idea. Underlying it are some more complicated statistics that you don't really need to worry about too much. But basically, you by using methods like this, you can it's actually a very powerful technique, as long as you have a reasonable sized family, to identify where disease genes are in, in humans. I'll skip through this because it's not so important. But uh, linkage as a, a, a disease mapping method works well when your disease is, is rare. Your disease undergoes Mendelian inheritance. Most of the disease risk is accounted for by one gene. And ideally, you'll have a disease that is very easy to say yes or no, does any one individual have it? So it should have an early age of onset and a straightforward diagnosis. If you're looking at something like Alzheimer's disease and you have a pedigree here, you might have to wait until these people are like 70 years old to know, well, are they affected or are they not? That's a problem. But it's been used very successfully historically for studying many different human phenotypes and really was the sort of predecessor of genome-wide association studies. Genome-wide association studies, what people tend to do these days to try and identify disease genes, but whereas linkage is a technique that is, is well-suited for studying Mendelian disorders, the technique of, of GWAS is well-suited for studying polygenic disorders that are maybe caused by common variations. So this is typically applied to, you know, coronary artery disease, height, obesity, schizophrenia, things like that, things that we know are, are generally polygenic in nature. The fundamentals of GWAS are essentially similar to linkage. Linkage you're carrying out within a defined nuclear family. The individuals are all related. GWAS using unrelated individuals, and that's the main difference. But you're basically still working on the premise that even if you don't know exactly what the disease-causing variant is, if you have and are able to genotype a SNP that is close to that and lies sufficiently close that it's not going to be separated by recombination too often, you should be able to identify the piece of chromosome where the disease-causing allele lies. As I say, in GWAS, you're just simply doing this now in unrelated individuals. That means there's been many more chances for recombination to occur, and so your resolution is much, much finer than in, in linkage. Also means you need to genotype a lot more SNPs. And so the principle of GWAS is very, very simple. You simply take a large population of individuals who are affected with a specific disease, here diabetes, a population of individuals who don't have the disease controls, You'll type, you know, a million variants or something across the genome, and then you're essentially just doing like a million chi-squared tests. And it's just asking, can I find a genetic variant somewhere in the genome that has a significantly different frequency between case and control? If the answer is yes, presumably that variant is, it could itself be the disease-causing variant, but more likely it's just going to be tagging an LD block where the variant that's causing disease occurs. And I say, the idea of GWAS was 
all based on the premise of first, you know, cataloging common variants, developing these high throughput arrays where you could genotype a lot of SNPs, and has been, you could argue, successful in mapping many different um, disease phenotypes. This is one of the first sort of seminal papers at the time. I think this was published in 2008. They looked at 14,000 different uh, individuals uh, with a variety of common diseases. Some modern GWASs use upwards of 100,000 individuals. So kind of a big amount of work. And there are now maps of all the different um, genome-wide association studies. This is uh, actually a bit out of date. I need to update my slides. So this is something from the genome-wide association study catalog maintained by NHGRI. Each one of these symbols is showing the location of a different disease that's been mapped on a chromosome. And you can basically see that most regions of the human genome have now been associated with different phenotypes. A couple of things to note. The X is strangely lacking. That's not because there are no diseases caused by genes on the X. It's because most people throw out the X chromosome when they do these kind of studies, just because it's harder to work with because of X chromosome inactivation in females, because males and females have dosage differences. One other thing to notice is there's a chunk of DNA right up here, the HLA locus, which has usually gets hits in pretty much every uh, genome-wide association study that's done. And this is because it contains a whole bunch of genes involved in uh, modifying immune response, so every phenotype that involves some autoimmune component usually get a hit in the HLA locus. And you can basically see it you know, right here. Arthritis, diabetes, there's a lower hit here in type 2 diabetes. Now, when you look at the actual risk alleles that are identified in GWAS, it doesn't matter what phenotype you look in, the odds ratio, that is, how strong an effect does that variant have on dictating whether you will or will not get that particular disease, is relatively modest. So these are ones that actually have quite large <coughs> effects, you know, 1.7. So in other words, if you have this SNP, you have a 70% higher chance of getting the disease than somebody that doesn't have that SNP. A lot of variants detected now by larger GWASs have, you know, 5% increased risk, 10% increased risk. And so there's exactly this question of how useful are these things when it, t it comes to informing people's disease risk. You know, companies like 23andMe, you can, I've had my DNA tested by them and they'll tell you all kinds of things. And that's partly why the FDA shut them down for a long time, because they didn't think it was useful to go telling people, you know, via an email, oh, you carry some genetic variant that's going to increase your risk of coronary artery disease by 3%. What does that mean? What do I do? This is a useful slide just for thinking about different kinds of studies and what kinds of things they're going to tell you in terms of the spectrum of genetic variants and disease risk. So if we're thinking about things like Mendelian disorders, these are things like, you know, muscular dystrophy, you know, early onset Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. These things are really easy to find using a simple linkage analysis, is a, a well-suited method for them, or even pedigree analysis using things like exome sequencing. These are variants that have very strong effects, so they're highly penetrant. You have the variant, you get the disease, almost for sure. But in contrast, they're very rare, so very few people in the population carry them. Over in this corner, these are variants that are typically common. So, you know, allele frequencies are 5, 10%, 20%. Um, but in contrast, their effect uh, on disease, their penetrance is very low. So even though a lot of people may carry them, it maybe only changes your disease risk by a few percent. People are now starting to do these studies that are getting at this chunk in the middle, the variants that are low frequency, uncommon, but perhaps have modest to intermediate effects. Uh, and then there is two other parts that basically things that are rare and have small effect that are impossible to identify statistically, or things that are very common with very strong effects and those are really rare. Otherwise, everyone would be walking around with all kinds of disease. And as I say, GWAS is, some people argue, has been very successful but has a lot of limitations. You need to look at thousands of individuals. There are some problems with it in terms of things like population stratification. What does it mean? And just to illustrate this, here's a couple of examples of GWAS that look on the surface really successful, but let's just dig into what that actually means. So this was a really interesting one, came out a few years ago. It was a study where they were looking at a particular drug, a non-steroidal painkiller that used for originally prescribed for treating arthritis. A few months after this drug first came on the market, it was withdrawn because certain people that took it would die. They would basically get a really severe liver reaction, their livers would pack up and the person would, would die. I mean, they didn't have their arthritis so badly, but they were dead. So that was bad. So the company uh, and some collaborators decided to say, okay, can we find genetic variants that may predict which people, when I give them this drug, will die and which people, when I give them the drug, won't die? 
because that would be really great. And we could do, you know, personalized you know, pharmacogenetics and prescribe people, only prescribe this drug to the people that, it, that uh, are going to tolerate it. So they took a whole bunch of people with and without the severe reactions, had a great GWAS hit, you know, nice p-value, followed up with replication, got p-values, you know, 10 to the minus 25. So like, yeah, we've definitely pinpointed the, the main region in the genome that's dictating uh, your, your response to this drug. The problem is, is that only a, about 8% of individuals that carry this variant that's most strongly implicated, even when you give them the drug, will have the adverse reaction. So, you know, just as a random population sample, maybe 1% of people, if you randomly get it, would get an adverse reaction. If you genotype everybody, say, oh, these are the people most at risk, still 92% of those people will be just fine if you give them the drug. And in contrast, you know, maybe if you said the negative predictive value, even if you don't carry the variant, there's still a 1% frequency you'd die if you took that drug. So in other words, clinically, even though you've had a successful GWAS hit, it's still not the kind of thing that I is really actionable in terms of the clinic because, you know, 1% of the people that don't carry it are still going to die. That's not great odds. So they did not return the blood back to that process? I don't think so, no. I mean, I wouldn't take that. Somebody said even after they genotyped you, hey, there's a 1% chance you might die if you take this. And then this is my last slide before we break. This is one of the largest genome-wide association studies ever performed. They looked at more than a quarter of a million individuals. It's this huge consortium. It's, in fact, called the Giant Consortium. And looking at, basically, human height and growth. Um, and this was their latest iteration. And so, you know, this was a, a big paper where they basically said, you know, after we've looked at these quarter of a million individuals, we do the association study and ask, you know, what variants are associated with human height. If they add together all the variants, nearly 10,000, their claim is, is that they can explain 29% of the genetic variation in height. So you may think, okay, that's not bad. But you can go back about 150 years, and this guy called Francis Galton in the UK figured out that simply if you measure the height of your two parents, average it, you can explain 40% of the variation in height. You know, 140 years later, genotyping quarter of a million people, you're still better off just measuring your mum and dad, averaging it, and that's going to be better than, than this. All right, so we're going to kind of keep on going on this similar theme, but I'm going to talk more about different types of variation that occur in human genomes. And so back to the slide again of just considering the different types of genetic variation there are, single nucleotide variants, just as a, a sort of point of semantics. Single nucleotide variants have different names. Um, historically, they're often called single nucleotide polymorphisms. The phrase polymorphism in implies something's present at 1% frequency or greater is the classic definition. Typically in sort of, you know, sequencing studies, if people are looking in a particular disease and you find a, a, a single base pair change in a disease gene that creates a stop codon, people often call that a point mutation. It's exactly the same thing. It's a change of one nucleotide in our genome. It just so happens people often use that phrase to refer to something that's disease associated, typically rare, typically damaging, whereas SNP for uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, or more commonly people use SNV. It's just a more inclusive phrase, single nucleotide variation. It's all the same thing. It's just a change of one base. I'm going to talk more about this kind of class of, of genetic variation, sort of structural variation or copy number variation, and a little bit about some of these, so particularly tandem repeats and microsatellites and what they are and, and maybe why they're interesting. Okay, so I just talked about that. Copy number variants, again, previously often called copy number polymorphisms, but uh, basically the same thing, CNP, CNV. These are typically larger changes in our genome. There is no really no hard definition of like the smallest size of a CNV. As a working definition, people often will say 1 kb or greater, but some of these can be many megabases in size. And in fact, many of us in this room will probably have copy number variations in our genome where we have hundreds of KB of sequence that somebody else doesn't have or vice versa. More broadly, we could call these structural variations because copy number variation implies either a gain or loss, but there are also things like inversions which may just be a piece of DNA flipping in orientation without the gain or loss of any particular sequence. And then another phrase that's often used, particularly in uh, conjunction with tandem repeats, they're sometimes called VNTRs, which stands for variable number of tandem repeats. This is basically a sequence it can be as small as a single nucleotide. So here, for example, is a poly A motif that's repeated many times. In other cases, you can have chunks of DNA, tens of KB in size, where that you know, 
say, 20 kV motif is repeated multiple times, or even 100 kV that's repeated multiple times in tandem. And there are places in our genome like that. In the case of these very large VNTRs, they can have whole genes within them. So now you have a tandem repeat that is where different people are gaining or losing multi-copy genes. And I'll show you some really crazy examples of those. Single nucleotide variants are the most common kind of genetic variation in our genome. Each of us typically carries between about three and five million uh, single nucleotide variants in our DNA. Just as a very rough approximation, that's about one per kilobase. So they're pretty frequent. This variation number, I said three to five million. Basically, you know, when we talk about genetic variation, it's usually in relation to our reference genome, this draft, finished, not really finished genome that's available publicly. Usually, if you sequence somebody's DNA, you'll say, how does this person's genome that I've sequenced compare to the reference genome? You can then apply coordinates and talk to other people and they know which bit of DNA you're talking about. And this is just saying, how many variants in relation to the reference genome did I find? We don't know the exact identities of the people that were used in the Human Genome Project. One was probably living in Buffalo, New York. Somebody else was probably living in California. And that's simply because the back libraries that predominantly went into the Human Genome Project, one was generated at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, and one was generated at Caltech in LA. And they were probably both Caucasian, because typically if you sequence an African, then we're going to have like 5 million variants. If you sequence a European, it's going to be more like 3 million. And just as a back of the envelope, about 10,000 variants in your protein coding regions of your genome you will find in any one individual. And that's you know, only about 0.3% of all the variants in our DNA. So the first person who's, apart from the Human Genome Mapping Project, first individual um, who had their DNA sequence uh, was Jim Watson. This was done, I think, purely for publicity reasons by 454 Sequencing, which is a company that has since gone basically out of business, and in fact, Mount Sinai bought up their sequencing facility in Connecticut and now runs a large clinical sequencing setup up there. So his, his genome was sequenced using this, this technology, and as I say, found about 10,000 variants in his protein coding regions, and it's estimated that each one of us, if you were to sequence our, our DNA in this room, each one of us would probably be carriers for about 20 different stop codons in different genes, and probably we carry 50 to 100 recessive mutations in, in other genes in our genome. I, for example, know I'm a carrier of PKU. I have my 23andMe done, so um, what that means for me, I don't really know, but I'm fine. But the big question is, as geneticists, we try and interpret all of this genetic variation and try and figure out what does that mean for an individual. And I told you already a bit about GWAS and the good and bad parts of that, but now scale that up to the fact that you know we each have, say, three, four, five million variants, and how do we figure out this mess of ascribing significance or not to all of these different variations we have. So just to give you an example, even if we're talking about just the protein coding portion of our genome, which I say is only about 0.3% of the genetic variants, some changes that we carry will be presumably non-functional, at least at the protein level. So for example, if this person here has an A to a G variant, um, GCA in a protein coding region in a, a, a codon actually codes for alanine, as does GCG, also codes for alanine. This would be a silent uh, what we call uh, synonymous base change. Even though there's a change in the nucleic acid sequence, there's no change in the resulting amino acid sequence. Other changes, these are typically often at the what we call the third base wobble position, because many triplets, it's only the first two bases of the codon that actually are important in coding any one amino acid. Other changes here, this is another G2A now happen happening at the second base of this codon. This results in a change of an arginine to a lysine. The question is, is that functional? Is that important? This individual will now be heterozygous. If, if they're heterozygous carrier, will now make two different versions of that protein. But in many cases, these are probably benign events. And these are the most easily classifiable types of genetic change in our DNA out of you know, the millions that we carry. And even with these, we struggle. In contrast, you know, more than 99% of the genetic variants we carry at the SNP level occur outside of protein coding regions. Some of these may be functional. This is just a hypothetical example of how that could happen. So for example, if we imagine a transcription factor binding site, it's in a regulatory region of DNA perhaps. And if you now have a change uh, of this particular base, a G to a C, maybe now the transcription factor doesn't bind here. And maybe now this gene that should be switched on somehow you know, does not get activated. And that's just an uh, one possible example of how non-coding variants can, uh, can uh, 
be functional. So I already mentioned the HapMap project. This was the sort of first large project that sought to uh, profile genetic variation. Their defined aims were to identify all SNPs in the human genome with at least 5% minor allele frequency. That is 5% of the haplotypes in a segregating the population carry that variant. With the idea that they could then identify tag SNPs that could be used in GWAS. And it was done in three different phases. The overall found about 3 million variants looking across more than 1,000 individuals. They chose specific populations to study based on what was thought to be the patterns of how modern humans basically migrated with this sort of out of Africa hypothesis. And so these were the different populations that were studied, you know, trying to look at different ethnic groups who were spaced sort of strategically around uh, the world. And since the HAP map, this has now really been superseded by the Thousand Genomes Project. This was proposed maybe uh, about seven or eight years ago. Its aim was, if you like, a kind of, you know, version of the HAP map on steroids using uh, next-gen sequencing technologies. Their aims were to identify 95% of the variations in the human genome with at least 1% allele frequency, and looking in coding regions to find variants down to about 0.1% allele frequency. Despite its name, it's now actually looked at about 2,500 individuals. It's really just a factor of the fact that sequencing's got a lot cheaper than when they first uh, sort of proposed the project. And it had two main parts low coverage sequencing of the entire genome. So that was sequenced to about 10x coverage. I'll explain what that is in a minute. In 26 different populations. And then much deeper sequencing, targeted sequencing of the protein coding portion of the genome, uh, up to about 50 to 80x coverage, which gives you basically higher quality data. And all of that data, again, is publicly available. There's been uh, a few recent papers that have been published describing that and the, the, the latest phase of this project. There are other ways to look at SNPs. This is in the HapMap browser. And really, I put this up just to show you that each of these little bars, the you know, A, C, H, D, each one of these corresponds to a different population. So Y is Yoruban, I think. And I don't even know what the other ones are offhand. But basically, the red and the blue are saying what's the frequency of the, of the different allele there. And basically, you'll note that some alleles vary significantly in frequency between populations. So for example, you know, here's an allele that's very common in Yorubans from West Africa. I think T is Tuscan, so this allele is relatively rare. So some variants show large differences uh, in populations in terms of their frequency. So partly with this, this idea that variants show wide ranges in their frequency in different populations, if you have genotyping data from a variety of different individuals, you can actually um, ascertain the ethnic background of that individual simply using a SNP data with actually pretty remarkable accuracy. So this is um, a technique called PCA, which stands for Principal Component Analysis, basically just taking you know, a sample of SNP genotypes from across the genome or even just using one chromosome, and here individuals from the Thousand Genome Project from various different populations have been plotted in different colors. So just to orientate you, these are Asians, Chinese, Japanese. This blue cluster here is Europeans. The brown individuals over here are um, Africans. And for example, you can start to see the red squares. These are African Americans from the southwest of the USA. Not surprisingly, many cluster with the um, native Africans, but there's a cline up here extending towards the Europeans showing the, the basically varying ethnic background, the contribution of European alleles to the gene pool that was mixed in, probably due uh, to the slave trade. And what's really interesting is people have taken this same approach, and this is a figure from a paper where somebody studied in detail many different individuals from all over uh, Europe, and they figured out that simply superimposing this principal component analysis plot, this mathematical technique that sort of derives uh, vectors that best characterize the, the variance within a population. Superimposing that plot over a map of Europe, oh, I missed out the legend, you can basically identify what country an individual comes from based on the SNP data, but in many instances, you know, what part, what subpart of a, or what region of a country they might originate from. So it's pretty amazing that, you know, just by looking at some DNA genotypes, you can say, oh, this person's probably from Northern England, or maybe from southwestern Spain or, you know, southwestern France. Think about things like forensics and stuff. That's pretty cool. 
Nowadays, I already told you a bit about arrays and things. You know, the emphasis is moving fast to basically away from microarrays to gene type SNPs and towards sequencing. So I just want to touch upon this a bit. You're going to get a lot more in-depth uh, description of modern uh, genomic technologies tomorrow from uh, Milind Mahajan, who's the manager of the genomics core here. But I just want to kind of give you an overview and talk about a few concepts. Modern sequencing approaches, and you can contrast this to how I told you that the draft human genome was assembled, basically just take somebody's DNA, chop it up into fragments, adapt bits of uh, DNA onto the ends of those fragments and throw them into a sequencing machine. An important concept to kind of get your head around is that when you sequence somebody's DNA, this idea of, of coverage, so you take fragments of DNA, you sequence them, you map them back to a genome after they come out of the machine, depending on how much sequencing you did, you may get a different number of reads overlapping different regions. So for example, if each of these colored bars represents a sequence read that came uh, out of my machine, if I take this base here in their genome, there are only two reads that overlap that, that region. So there is 2x coverage at this site. In contrast, this place here, this base has eight different reads overlapping it, so I now have 8x coverage. It's a, a fundamental statistic when we talk about sequencing because it defines the data quality, how much confidence do we have, how much data do we have to determine what variants may be in a particular region. And this is particularly important as individual reads have errors in them at some frequency, which basically adds noise to our, our, uh, our data. And just to give you a, a sort of a baseline, what's typically considered to be high quality sequencing of a genome these days is at least 20 or 30x coverage of a genome. So if you were to sequence your DNA and, and say, I want to do a reasonable job, you'd be aiming for about 30x coverage. That means every base in your genome, on average, has 30 independent reads overlapping it. When you think that we're diploid, that actually means 15 reads on average per chromosome, presumably we've randomly sampled from the two alleles that you have. This is just a graph showing you how the cost of genome sequencing has changed in the last sort of 20 years or so, and it's changed a lot. So just to note, this is a log scale here on the y-axis. This is the uh, cost per base in dollars, I think, uh, versus time here at the bottom. That's that other date. Back in the 90s um, or, or uh, 2000s, um, when the Human Genome Project was done, I'd say it was different estimates, but definitely more than a billion dollars to do a genome. So the cost per base there you can calculate was you know, more than $10 per base, which is kind of crazy. 2008, this technology called 454 sequencing came along. Um, then it took about three months to sequence a genome, and to do Jim Watson cost around a million dollars. Today, you could, for example, at the New York Genome Center, they could, in theory, sequence somebody's DNA. If you send it to them, they could probably get you back the reads in about two or three days. Um, I don't know their exact price. I think it's a bit less than $2,000 now, maybe like $1,800. So you just think within you know, two decades, we've gone from uh, a billion dollars and several years of work to a couple of grand and a couple of days' work. And we're probably on course in another year or so for that price to maybe be ar around $1,000 or so. And you know, now we're getting into the realms of sequencing some of the genome to high quality may cost about the same as doing something like an MRI, which you know, it's not a routine medical procedure, but it's, it's happening on an everyday basis. And indeed, like I said, New York Genome Center, many other genome centers around the world are, I don't even remember what the last projections I read, but you know, Probably 100,000 or more genomes are going to be sequenced in the next year, maybe you know, two or three times that number. So people are, are starting to ramp up now to doing you know, large-scale, high-quality genome sequencing for large numbers of indivi individuals. And as I say, Millen will tell you a lot more about this tomorrow. Another technique that has been used a lot you know, in the last sort of five to eight years, People are starting to move away from it now more towards genome sequencing is something called exome sequencing. This is basically um, a method of doing targeted sequencing and just pulling out the pieces of the genome that you might be specifically interested to look at and just trying to get sequences based on those. You can in fact use it for any region of the genome you want, but mostly people are interested in looking at protein coding regions, i.e. the exome, you know, all the exons in the genome, it's called the exome. And the way it works is you start with somebody's genomic DNA, you chop it up, you create what's called a library, and then you add on adapters to the end of those molecules. It was initially done using microarrays, where you'd have probes stuck on a glass slide, but now is basically all done in solution because it's uh, much more amenable to high throughput methods. So in order to specifically pull out and sequence bits of DNA only corresponding to the coding regions of the genome, 
you have what are called um, uh, sort of baits or, or, or capture probes that correspond, for example, you know, one or two for every coding region, coding exon of the genome. And specifically, these are labeled with streptavidin. So your input library that goes in is first denatured, so the DNA is single-stranded. Your capture probes are also single-stranded and complementary, so they will hybridize the DNA of the individual you've created a, a sequencing library from to your capture probes that have a streptavidin tag. Uh, sorry, a biotin tag. You then use streptavidin to pull those out, so you've now pulled out all the pieces of DNA that hybridized your capture probes, which correspond to the exons. You amplify those and throw them into a sequencer. And you can, if it's done well, you can get 500 to 1,000 fold enrichment for the bits of DNA you're interested in. The bottom line there is, is that you, you need to spend a lot less money to sequence the 1% of the genome you're interested in than sequencing the entire genome, of which 99% is non-coding, and you have a really hard job interpreting any variants you might see there. So it's often called sequence capture, or like I say, just exome sequencing uh, as well, because people usually use it for sequencing exons only. So for example, if you did something like that, you're looking along a chromosome, your coverage, the sequence reads you get may correspond just to the pieces where your capture probes are, depending on where you choose those. Uh, um, uh, you can order customizable designs for whatever region of the genome you want. So for example, you could just target, you know, one megabase region of a chromosome and sequence that region in depth in individuals if you wanted. One of the sort of foibles of sequence capture is that you tend to get very variable coverage out at the end. It doesn't give you nice, even data across your whole region. Some bits of DNA sequence and hybridize very well. Other bits of DNA maybe have secondary structures, maybe are very GC-rich, are hard to amplify. And so you may get much, much lower coverage in some regions than others. But exome sequencing has now been used a lot as a method for identifying Mendelian diseases. And it's really sort of I would say led to a renaissance in uh, disease gene identification. There are now, like I say, several centers in the US that are specifically dedicated where for free you can propose and say, hey, I have these cohort of patients, even if it's just like sometimes one family with some unknown disease, will you sequence them for me? And if they agree, you just send them their DNA and they'll send you back the exome sequencing data. And often they'll try and pull together individuals with similar phenotypes from different investigators, and this has led to the, the identification of disease-causing variants that underlie certain uh, Mendelian disorders. People use different strategies for this kind of thing, so you can apply exome sequencing to finding disease genes. One strategy would be here, where you have multiple unrelated families that have maybe a, an affected individuals with what you think are similar clinical phenotypes, where you suspect maybe it could be the same gene involved. Here you'd just be looking for some mutation that's common to all these individuals that unaffected individuals don't. You can apply it to families that, you know, 10 or 20 years ago we may have used linkage for. And in fact, now people will often analyze their exome sequencing data, do a linkage study on it, figure out what region of the genome is common to all the affected people. Now, rather than having to look at 20,000 genes, you may have only have to look at 200 within a linkage region. And then you analyze those genes and ask, you know, where is the, a damaging mutation, for example. It has even been applied to just single trios where you have uh, an affected child, parents are normal. Here your hypothesis is there is a de novo mutation in the child that's causing the disease. The caveat is, I told you, on average there's about 100 to 200 de novo mutations that we all carry. As the coding region is about 1%, that means on average each of us is carrying a de novo coding variant in our DNA. So, you know. Bear that in mind. Just because you find a de novo coding variant doesn't mean it is causing the disease. And then there are other studies. For example, people are now sort of the next tier of GWAS is people will take cohorts, often selecting extremes of phenotypes, and you know do exome sequencing in those to try and find higher penetrance mutations that may be involved in, in sometimes common disorders. This is just one example, one of the first uh, syndromes that was solved by exome sequencing, published in 2009. It was looking at a disease called Miller syndrome. It's a rare malformation disorder with a variety of congenital abnormalities. They only studied two affected SIBs and two other unrelated people that had the same clinical manifestations. And so it has a typical sort of facial appearance that looks like this with you know, other characteristic deformities. And even just sequencing these four basically affected individuals by taking the different families they had, 
filtering their variants for those that were damaging, so stands for non-synonymous, splice site, or stop code on, I think. Removing variants that were found in normal individuals from like the hat map and predicted to be uh, uh, damaging, they could get down to just a single mutation in the genome that was for ex or a single gene that was shared across all affected people, not found in normal controls. And identified this gene, DHODH, where if they went to additional families, they find those also have the mutations in that same gene. So you're, re you know, in some cases, if you get lucky, you literally only need two or three people that have some shared phenotype and you can identify a disease gene using this kind of approach. Sorry, I didn't do a good job of <laughs> finishing up my slides. But basically, exome sequencing can be a powerful method for finding disease genes uh, that are causing Mendelian disorders. And it's really, I would say in the last five years, there's probably been probably another you know, 500 to 1,000 genes that previously we had no idea what they do that are now being implicated as, as, as causes of, of, of different human diseases. I want to move on a little bit now and talk about structural variation in genomes and the different flavors of that and how we go about studying it. So this cartoon just sort of describes different kinds of structural variations we can see. If we have, for example, here three different genes, A, B, C, some individuals may carry a deletion where they lose a whole gene that other people have. You can have an insertion in some individuals of something that's in some cases missing from the reference genome. That's another thing just to bear in mind, just because the reference genome is what we have, it's just sequenced from a person. It does not represent everything that's all of us carry in the population. In fact, the reference genome has some alleles that nobody else on the planet carries. So, you know, just because something's a reference allele doesn't mean to say it's common, doesn't mean to say it's benign, it's just something that somebody carries that happen to be sequenced. So there are plenty of bits of DNA that other people, in fact, most people in the population have that's missing from the reference genome. Some places in our genomes have inversion, where we don't gain or lose anything, but the orientation is flipped. Um, we also have things like tandem duplications, where something will get repeated. And this is a, maybe a more minor class, but where you have a duplication that's a copy gets put somewhere else in the genome. This is like the, the genesis of uh, segmental duplications I referred to earlier. And just as a snapshot, this is just uh, some stuff I worked on many years ago. This is just looking at three different individuals and characterizing copy number variations in three different people's genomes versus the reference, and just showing you the distribution of insertions, deletions, inversions that were found, you know, represented by each of these colored bars. And basically, the take home message here is all of us carry lots of copy number variations, lots of structural variations. Again, the reference genome, don't think of it as like a linear strand of A's, T's, C's, and G's with odd changes. There are whole bits that are chopped out, added in, flipped around between different people. And I just circled a couple of regions here. There are some bits of our genome that are incredibly variable. Again, if you looked in different people, in, even in this room, probably everyone would have some different configuration of DNA. From this region here, 1Q21 is incredibly variable. This region at the end of chromosome 8, this actually has a bunch of genes involved in immune function that have been implicated in a variety of different phenotypes where there are large tandem arrays of immune genes that shrink and expand in different people. One of the earlier technologies that was used to study copy number variations in genomes was a microarray-based approach called Array Comparative Genomic Hybridization, or Array CGH. The way in which this technology works is you have a glass slide, a, a standard microscope slide, onto which you um, spot DNA corresponding to probes of pieces of DNA that you want to uh, uh, assay. This is a picture of me actually holding an array that I made. Um, and the arrays look something like this. Each one of these little spots, they're, they're, they're done in triplicate just so you get multiple data points for the same thing to, to get nice robust data. Um, each spot corresponds to, in this case, it was a region of maybe like 100 KB of DNA that you're asked you could then assay within anybody's genome. And the way in which it works is you, as the name suggests, comparative genomic hybridization. You take two individuals' DNA, a test sample that you want to assay, a reference sample, which could just be another individual, or it could be a mix of different people's DNA thrown in together, pooled. You label those two DNAs with different fluorescent colored dyes, typically green Psi 3, red Psi 5, and then you mix those together and co-hybridize them onto the slide, your array. And the basic idea is, as you're mixing red and green together, if my test individual has the same copy number as my reference person, there should be equal amounts of red and green labeled DNA hybridizing, and those will come up as yellow. 
In contrast, if my test person has, say, a duplication, that will come up as green because there is more green DNA binding to that probe. If my test individual has a deletion, so they only have one copy, this person has two, there will be more red DNA binding, and so those spots will come up as more red colored. And you can kind of see that on here. There's some places that look more green, some places that look more red. And so the final output, if your experiment works well, looks something like this. Each point is an individual probe on your array. This is data from a sort of genome-wide array that has probes spaced throughout the genome. Usually when you look at the data, you look at it in order of chromosome, chromosome 1 through the genome to X and Y at the end. The y-axis is what we show the relative intensity of red to green, converted here to a log 2 ratio. So zero is meaning there's the same amount of red versus green DNA, uh, meaning no change of copy number. If you have a positive signal, that means there's more test DNA, either as a gain of copy in my test sample. Uh, below the axis is a, a loss, so a deletion. So here you can instantly tell all the probes on the X go up, all the ones on the Y go down. So here I had a female test and a male reference. Um, and then what you're looking for are things like this, where you have, here's a clear region where there's a deletion in my test, or conversely it could be a duplication in my reference, and vice versa, a likely duplication in my, my test individual. This sort of methodology is taken over a lot now from cytogenetics, where you're looking down the, the microscope at chromosomes. And with modern arrays, you can order these, and for you know, relatively cheap, you know, a couple hundred dollars, you can have, in some cases, millions of probes throughout the genome and get very high resolution data looking at copy number variants across the genome. And so these are often used, for example, in prenatal genetics, you know, on amniocentesis and things, because it gives you very good ability to spot trisomies and other smaller copy number changes. This is just an example of applying it to, if you like, sort of personalized genomics. A race CGH profile derived from a cancer, so a tumor. In this particular case, your test DNA is DNA derived from the tumor. Your reference DNA is match DNA from the same person, but from, you know, just say blood or from outside the tumor site. And so here you're characterizing copy number changes that occur in the tumor versus their, their somatic DNA. What you can see is the tumor has gained whole copies of chromosome 7, 19, and 20. It's lost chromosome 10. But interestingly, it's got a homozygous deletion here of a tumor suppressor gene, which is probably something important in the, the genesis of that particular cancer. But interestingly, there's one place right here where you can see there's what looks like a massive expansion. It's probably got many, many copies of this gene called EGFR. And this is clinically relevant as there are now specific drugs that are developed. For example, this is a recurrent change seen in many types of cancer that specifically inhibit EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor. And so now knowing this from this person's tumor, you could predict that this would be a cancer, a tumor that might be susceptible to EGFR treatment. So it's that sort of, you know, the first line in sort of personalized genomics for, in this case, treating cancer. Now, people are starting to now use sequencing-based technologies for uh, profiling structural variants. And as I say, when you generate a sequencing library for doing whole genome sequencing, you take somebody's DNA, you chop it up. It can either go into a, a circularized vector or just linear fragments to make this library. You throw those in the sequencer, you get the reads back, and you map them back to your genome. And so when you map those reads back, sometimes you just get, depending on the way you set the reference, the, the, the experiment up, single reads that just map randomly in the genome. Or you can also do an experiment where you, you read into both ends of a, a molecule in your sequencing library. It's called paired end sequencing. And that particular data gives you good ability to spot structural variations in somebody's genome. Because if we generate paired end sequences, so a molecule we sequence into both ends, and if we know that, for example, the sequencing library we generated was 500 base pair fragments, when we map these paired ends back to a genome, if there's no change between the person we sequenced and the reference genome, we expect the two end sequences we get to be about 500 base pairs apart and sort of facing each other because we sequence in from the ends of each molecule. So if we take paired end sequences from a single molecule, map them to the reference genome, we know our input library was, say, 500 base pairs in size, the fragments we were originally sequencing, but we map them back and suddenly we spot that, oh, when we map them, they only map 50 base pairs apart. That suggests that now there was maybe a deletion in the person we sequenced. 
If we map them and suddenly they map 10 KB apart, that's way bigger than the library you made, that suggests there was, in the person we sequenced, a big chunk of DNA there that wasn't in the reference genome. If we map these paired ends that we know should face each other, because we sequence into the end of each molecule, and we find now they're flipped in orientation, that suggests there's an underlying inversion. Another approach people use is something called split read mapping. This is where you map your reads and find that if one bit of the read maps here, there's a gap and the next bit maps over there, that maybe there's basically a, an extra bit of DNA thrown in there somewhere that wasn't in the reference. And this final method here called read depth analysis is based on the notion that if you're randomly generating reads from a sequencing library from somebody's genome, there should be some expectation of even coverage across the genome. If you suddenly see a piece of DNA where you get a lot more reads mapping to it than you expect, maybe there were more copies of that in the person we sequenced. If you get a lot less reads mapping to a certain region, suddenly the read coverage drops off for a while and then comes back up, maybe there's an underlying deletion. The person you sequenced only had one copy of that region, so you get less reads coming from it. So these kind of approaches are being applied to study genomes quite a lot now. And this idea of, of paired end mapping, I'll explain a bit better. So as it was originally applied, people developed libraries that had inserts that around 40 KB in size. So they would take somebody's DNA, chop it up into 40 KB pieces, put it into these special vectors called plasmids, and you knew that the piece of DNA from that person you had was 40 KB in size. You would then generate end sequences from your, your standard uh, uh, cloning vector, align those reads to the genome, and uh, like I say, you expect those reads to all map you know, a certain distance apart. Where you find they map differently, uh, further apart than you expect, that suggests there's insertion. They map much smaller apart, so you know, less than 40 KB a deletion, or flipped around an inversion. And what was nice about these original methods is that these individual phosmids are bits of DNA cloned into a bacteria that were stored in a freezer. So when you found a location in the genome that had a structural variant, you could go back, take that phosmid, grow it up, extract DNA, and sequence the whole thing, and actually see what the structural vari variation was. So this was done for a lot of different structural variations. This is just a graphical way of showing that. So along the bottom axis here, this is the reference genome. Uh, sorry, this is the phosmid, showing the 40 KB of sequence of the phosmid. The top is the, the reference genome, and these lines basically join regions of, of sequence homology and allow you to visualize where the change occurs. So this is a place where the individual that we sequenced has basically a, a, a 12 KB insertion missing from the reference genome. We find other places like this where in the phosmid carrier they've lost this 14 KB chunk of individual uh, uh, of DNA. What's interesting is you'll see the, the two breakpoints here have these lines are indicating this homology. So this piece of DNA here is homologous to that, and the piece in between has been chopped out in somebody. So this is an example of where you have, again, the genome structure um, contributing, causing rearrangement. So it's presumably caused by some sort of homologous recombination event. You get other bits of DNA that are pretty crazy. I'll talk more about this. So this is an example of one of these variable number of tandem repeats. So basically you get this kind of, you see these all these arch lines saying this piece of DNA is the same as this, is the same as this, is the same as this, is the same as this. It's basically indicating there's um, some kind of tandem repeat that maybe there's about a three or four KB piece of DNA that's repeated multiple times in tandem. And this chromosome has around 12 copies of it. In this chromosome, they've lost some and gone down to nine copies. And there's actually uh, thousands of regions in our genome that kind of look like this, tandemly repeated chunks of DNA. And then you get other regions. I showed you the SMA locus earlier, where you, you know two different alleles are about a megabase difference in sequence, where just a lot of things change. So you know one person has, if you follow all these lines through, inversions, deletions, but again, you see there's like palindromic bits of DNA that are inverted repeats. So there's a, a lot of regions, again, of our DNA that have unusual structure that often undergo rearrangements uh, within the population. And, and like I say, this is that SMA locus I showed you before. There's exactly one of those just on a very, very large scale. I mentioned read depth as an approach for identifying copy number variants. This just sort of explains that in a bit more detail. So if we generated a random sequencing library from an individual, we get all the reads from our sequencer, we map them to the genome, 
if we'd sequenced that individual, for example, for an average of, say, two or three X coverage across the genome, you'd expect most of the genomes just to have two or three reads per, per site. But suddenly, you see a piece where there's maybe an average of six reads, so about double that. And just by applying some thresholds and, say, a sliding window, you may be able to identify, yes, there's a region here that has significantly greater, a uh, significantly greater number of reads mapping to it, suggesting maybe the individual you sequenced has a duplication. They had more copies of this piece of DNA in their genome. So when you sequenced it, you got more reads derived from that region coming out of the sequencer. This has been applied to study several hundred genomes now, and actually turns out to be a very effective way of identifying places in our genome where there are genes that are present in multiple copies, many of which show signatures of selection between different populations. And in fact, a lot of the genes that you see have roles in immunity. Um, so a recurrent theme is a lot of the genes that we have that have you know, antibacterial, antiviral functions tend to be very copy number variable, probably because it provides a lot of genetic variation, genetic robustness in the population to you know, different diseases that we may encounter. I already just touched on one example of a tan and repeat, but I want to talk about that a bit more. Tan and repeats come in, in a variety of different forms, but essentially they're characterized by a motif. It can be as small as one base, can be as large as hundreds of thousands of base pairs that's repeated multiple times in a head-to-tail fashion. So here's just an example of a piece of sequence where we have just, you know, random mixes of A, T, C, and G, and suddenly you see there's this region here where you have A, C repeated many times in a row. Uh, just as a rough count in the genome, there's probably at least a million tan and repeat regions like this in the human genome, so they're very, very common. In addition, things like centromeres, telomeres are composed almost exclusively of very large tan and repeats like this. And the reason why they're interesting is because this tandem repeated structure gives them very unusual properties um, that mean they're very, in, in many cases, unstable. So they will expand or contract during meiosis or even mitosis. What that means is many of these tandem repeated regions are very highly variable. So anyone in the population will, will exhibit different sizes of alleles. You know, here I'm just showing you maybe some of it has 15 copies, here it's contracted down to maybe like 8 copies. And this basically occurs due to either slippage or homologous recombination, changing, either deleting or adding in different copies as the polymerase goes along and reads through, and makes uh, a second copy of that during meiosis and mitosis. So it's been found recently that a lot of these tan and repeat regions actually do important things. So as they expand and contract, they will, for example, influence the expression level of genes nearby. And we know that some of them are involved in causing um, overt Mendelian disease. So for example, Fragile X, this is the most uh, common cause of intellectual disability in humans, is caused by an expanded uh, triplet repeat, a CGG motif that is on the X chromosome, just upstream of the FMR1 gene. Normal individuals have about five to 50 copies of this CGG repeat. For reasons we don't really know in some Rare individuals, it will expand, and once it gets above about 200 copies, so CGG repeated 200 times or more, that's called a, a full mutation, and it will basically become heavily methylated and switch the, the, the nearby FMR1 gene off. The reason the, the, the disease was called Fragile X, before anyone even knew there was a triplet repeat there, it was originally diagnosed um, using cytogenetics. If you cultured cells from an individual with this disease, in the absence of folate in the media, you would get the X chromosomes where the tip of the chromosome looked like it broke off. Hence, it was called Fragile X. What we now know is that's basically due to when you get this massive CGG repeat tract, the polymerase during cell division has a really hard time getting through it because it tends to fold up into this very complex secondary structure, and so you get a chromosome breakage, hence uh, the name of Fragile X. Yeah, I'm not aware of anybody using it for DNA sequencing, but that exact approach is actually used in RNA sequencing, or one type of RNA sequencing. So again, Milan will explain this more tomorrow, but um, if you were just to extract RNA from cells and sequence it without any purification or treatment, you would find about 99% of the RNA sequenced was things like ribosomal RNA, tRNA, just the sort of basic machinery of the cell. Usually, we're not interested so much in that. We're more interested in the um, uh, messenger RNAs that are protein coding. They only make up about 1% of total RNA. So one method that people use in RNA sequencing to is to get rid of all the stuff, like the ribosomal RNA, tRNA, is basically exactly what you kind of said, just a subtraction-based method where you use 
to, to leave. It's like a cocktail of probes that pull out all the stuff you don't want. You're left with the stuff you do want, the messenger RNAs, and that's what you put in the sequencer. So yeah, kind of what you outlined is people are actually using that. So I'm actually collaborating with somebody here who's just got a grant to do that, using CRISPR-Cas9 to pull out large DNA fragments for targeted sequencing. So it's kind of like a version of exome sequencing, but with exome sequencing, you're limited just to pulling out small fragments of a few hundred base pairs that are easily PCRable. Um, with CRISPR-Cas9, in theory, you can pull out regions that are tens or even hundreds of KB in size if you make your DNA in the right way, and then uh, you can use long read sequencing to get a lot better information of those. So yeah, it's, it's doable, but it's not easy. I mean, on the genome, that's much harder because the, the DNA sequence is so much more variable <laughs> you basically have to design uh, uh, subtraction things to most of the genome. It's much more efficient to say this is the bit I do want and pull that out and amplify it rather than try and get rid of everything else. For RNA, that works fine because most of the other stuff is all the same class. But, but yeah, you're thinking along the kind of lines that are effective. Just to give you an idea, so I was talking about Fragile X. This is that CGG repeat that actually expands in Fragile X. So here, this is again, you're looking in the UCSC genome browser at other TAN repeats, just to show you, here we're looking at a region of about 40 KB that there are you know, many other TAN repeats just scattered throughout the genome. In total, if you download this entire track of TAN repeats, just found by this algorithm here, uh, TAN repeats finder, there's about 100,000 TAN repeats in the human genome. So they are everywhere. And these are actually, many of them are used um, in forensics, for example, so you hear, you know, maybe a court case or somebody saying there was a one in 20 million chance that this sample of blood didn't come from this person that was accused of murder. It's typically because they'll genotype usually 12 or 16 very highly variable tandem repeat loci, and because they're so highly polymorphic, you know, you take 10 people, they'll each have a different set of alleles for any one locus. You do that over 15 or 20 different loci, you can basically get like a unique genetic fingerprint just by looking at, you know, 15 or so different highly polymorphic tandem repeats. So they're used a lot, you know, in, in other fields as well. I mentioned some tandem repeats can be really, really big. So that example in Fragile X is just a three base pair motif that's repeated many times. Here is an example of a region of the genome that's one of these kind of like crazy large tandem repeated regions. This is kind of what it looks like if you do an experiment called Fiberfish, where you stretch out chromatin fibers, and then applying here, they use both a red and a green probe that hybridizes to these salivary amylase genes. And what you can see on chromosomes derived from different people, you know, there's one pair here, another pair here, another, 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 each one is a copy of the gene, and you can see different chromosomes have different number of copies of these salivary amylase genes. When you look at the genome and what it looks like, you start to get hints of some weird stuff going on if you switch the right tracks on. So first you notice that when we look at the genes, there are all these genes with basically the same annotation, the same place, called different names, but repeated the same name multiple different times. So you know it's amylase 1A three times in a row. It's duplicated, so it's labeled as a segmentally duplicated region. It's annotated as a copy number variable region. And right next door, we have an assembly gap, so one of these 291 places in the genome where they couldn't join the chromosomes together. So these are all kind of signatures of something funky going on. And it's one of, I say, one of these regions that basically represents a tandem array of these salivary amylase genes repeated multiple times. Now this gene's really interesting because when people started looking at it, it was clear that it shows copy number variation, so some people will have uh, possessed different copy numbers of this gene. And in this study here, they looked at individuals from different human populations that, you know, historically subsisted on either high starch diets, so these were Western Europeans or sort of East Asian populations that, you know, for the last 10, 20,000 years have been growing wheat and rice, and that's been their main source of, of nutrition and compared it to some hunter-gatherer populations which typically have subsisted more on, you know, high-protein, low-starch kind of diets, and observed a consistent significant difference where populations with high-starch diets tend to have greater copy numbers of the salivary amylase gene. So this fits with the idea that, obviously, if you're eating wheat and rice, you can do better if you can extract more energy from that food, 
salivary amylase is your body's first line of digesting starch. So it looks like one of these regions that's tannery repeated, multi-copy, but has also undergone sort of selective pressures in recent human evolution. There's another one of these kind of gene families here. This is a, a gene family called the Rexo1 gene, located on chromosome 8, so we're just here. Again, you see this really weird structure when you look at it in the genome. There's a big assembly gap, so it's like a black hole that nobody quite knows what's going on in there. If we switch on this repeat mask of tracks, this is just common repeats. Not that that means anything specific, but it enables you to see this very distinct repeated pattern. So you can see straight away the sort of tandem repeated structure. The gene annotations kind of screwed up. It's got a gene that supposedly crosses the assembly gap with lots of other copies here and there. If you blap, uh, ask where is Rex on a genome, you get hits on many unassembled fragments, things that people don't really know where it maps, and again, lots of duplicated sequence. If you then ask, what does this region of genome, how big is it in real people? So here, it was annotated as about, I think, an 80 kb assembly gap and another like 40 kb of gene sequence on the side. So in the genome, it says, oh, it's 100 kb or so. If you actually start doing some pulse pool gel southern blots, you actually find the Rexo1 gene cluster is about one and a half megabases in size. So this is using a probe to one of these Rexo1 genes and you basically get a fragment saying it's about 15 or 20 times bigger than it's listed in the genome in real people, and is also very highly polymorphic. Some alleles are about 700 kb, some 1.6 megabases. And when we know that the copy, I think the gene's about 12 kb in size, that means this gene is varying from about 100 to 250 copies in normal people. So there's a gene here that we have about 250 copies of. We have no idea what it does. If you then look in primates, this is some stuff we did. Um, here we found a gorilla that has nearly a thousand copies of this gene. Like, and again, we have absolutely no idea what this gene's doing, but my guess is probably <laughs> something important. Why would we have a thousand copies of it? The only thing that's known about it is you get some weird autoantibodies popping up in association with hepatitis infection. So it could again have some roles in immunity, but we're not really sure. But it's one of these bits of DNA that's just really nasty to study. I mean, even after 13 years of the Human Genome Project, it's still horribly wrong in the genome assembly. And then I pointed out earlier a region on chromosome 8 that um, I said has a cluster of genes involved in sort of bacterial defense. It's called the beta defensin gene cluster. It's actually a peptide that's secreted um, either in your skin or mucous membranes, has antibacterial functions. And here people looked, uh, some studies were done. Um, this is in psoriasis originally. A replication study, both in Dutch and German case and controls. It was found that individuals with psoriasis tend to have higher copy number of beta defensin. So this is probably one of these examples of a gene that is obviously doing important stuff, you know, has, keeps your body safe from infection, you know, first line of defense on your skin and, and things that you're breathing in. But if you have too many copies of it, your body is maybe overreacting and predisposing you to, you know, autoimmune sort of diseases. Similar studies have been done. It's also been found to implicate in Crohn's disease as well, the exact same gene. So again, something that's secreted in your gut and when you have too much of it, maybe you're less likely to get infection, but more likely to get psoriasis, uh, Crohn's disease, things like that. So I'll finish up there. You guys will have plenty of time. But basically, I think a good conclusion there, our genome is complicated. Studying things like copy number variation is a lot harder than just genotyping SNPs with arrays. And there's a lot of things we don't really understand about copy number variable regions. Some of these multi-allelic crazy regions, I'm pretty sure are doing important stuff, but they're just very, very hard to make sense of with our current technologies. So that's, I think, it. Anyone has questions that they want to ask? Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you mean a composite ref, I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the wha what things are moving towards. So like I say, currently there's a single reference, but people are now tacking on alternate haplotype assemblies. <coughs> so certain hypervariable regions will now have, you know, for like HLA, there's six or seven different assemblies. So 
it'd be chromosome six, the original one, and they'll say for this region, one megabase, there's seven different versions of it you can look at too. Whether it will go to truly multiple reference genomes, <coughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, <coughs> taking that to extreme would be the idea that you could sort of do um, de novo assembly in any new individual that you sequence. In theory, that's the sort of ideal because there's always a lot of limitations if I wanted to profile your genome and say, how are you different? As soon as you start taking data from your genome and mapping it to something else, there's a lot of inherent biases in that process. You're instantly favoring seeing what you already know and not seeing what you don't already know. Um, so yeah, people have played around with de novo assembly, so generating new assemblies for anyone you sequence currently with the short read technologies that are nearly always used, that does a really terrible job. Because as soon as you hit a 6KB line element, you can't sequence across it, so you get a gap. As soon as you get a region of some complexity, it gets messed up, so you end up with this incredibly fragmented assembly that's really not much use. Um, but like I said, there are projects now going on where people are doing whole genome, high coverage sequence with things like PacBio, which gives you long reads, up to 20, 30KB reads in some cases that can traverse all these big complex regions. And there's some pretty good evidence that you can actually get better assemblies even than the human genome reference if it's done properly. Um, so yeah, maybe in a couple of years there'll be multiple human genome references available. It's basically going to add noise, yeah. but that as long as your read lengths are some reasonable s size, or e even if they're short reads, even like 40, 50 base pairs, it should still do a reasonable job in most places. As soon as you start to hit again more complex regions where there's duplicated sequences, repeats, it's going to get a bit flaky. But if you're just looking at kind of unique new chromatic sequence, it, it should do a reasonable job. Somebody else had a question? No. Yes, thank you. I think that that is what not only is true, but I think it's even better for the stable things that you know of that you use in pack bio rather than in chromatic genomes. I don't know whether that kind of applies to like other more reference genome type or high quality reference genome like this. Yeah, so like I say, I know there are people doing that right now, generating what they're calling platinum genomes. Um, Mm? The quality is good enough? Or yeah, so if you get up to like 100x coverage with PacBio, um, which right now is expensive, <laughs> um, we're talking, you know, $50,000 kind of for a genome. Um, yeah, you can, in some cases, have almost gap free assemblies for a whole, you know, spanning a whole chromosome, apart from the centromere, obviously. Um, and so, yeah, there's been quite a lot of success in closing some gaps in the human genome reference with PacBio sequencing right across them. If you take DNA from like a single individual uh, where you're not mixing together multiple people, which gives you a lot of problems, um, and particularly using some haploid input DNA, because all of us are diploid people, you know, we have two different alleles that you're when you get sequenced, you never know, does this read come from that chromosome or that chromosome? So when you're trying to stitch two together, you don't know if they actually came from the same molecule or from two different chromosomes. So people often use uh, a haploid input. So, you, you know, you know if you get a read from chromosome one, it, th they all came from the same original chromosome. So that makes your task a lot, lot easier because you're not, not trying to always make decision, is this phased together or am I looking at the other chromosome? So people for that have used um, what's called complete hydrotidiform moles. They're weird abnormalities of pregnancy where you get the original oocyte has lost its nucleus, it gets fertilized by a sperm that duplicates itself, so it's now completely homozygous for the whole genome. But genetically, they're really useful for things like that. All right, I think that's it.